Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. I'm Bill Kelly, the president of the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this important discussion of inequality and economic growth. As you can see, we have more than 400 people in the auditorium, many more joining us outside in overflow rooms, and, and I suspect thousands more as we live stream this conversation. That response, it seems to me, is an eloquent testament to the urgency of this issue and to the course to the esteem in which our speakers are held. Tony Atkinson, Paul Krugman, Christia Freeland, we are grateful to you and to all of you for joining us this evening. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Graduate Center's Advanced Research Collaborative, ARC, acronymically speaking, and the Luxembourg Income Study Center, that's LIS. ARC is an exciting initiative, we think, whose mission is to deploy the intellectual capital of the Graduate Center to engage some of the most pressing theoretical and logistical issues of the day. One of ARC's core missions is to disseminate its research through public programming and the use of new media. An excellent example is this evening's program. When we launched ARC, we identified several core research priorities. And one of those, the focus of our conversation this evening, is social and economic inequality. The Graduate Center's commitment to research and teaching related to inequality is strong, and our interest in this inquiry runs very deep indeed. LIS is one of the Graduate Center's crown jewels. It's, as you will certainly know, an internationally celebrated data archive and research center devoted to comparative research on socioeconomic inequalities. Combining the respective strengths and engaging the congruent interests of ARC and LIS have proven to be a productive strategy, one that has advanced the interest, I believe, of both parties and has deeply enriched the scholarly, the pedagogic, and the public outreach of the Graduate Center. By way of very brief preview of tonight's conversation, I would note simply that few social and economic conditions are more compelling or more vexing than inequality. Yet economic inequality as distinct from poverty has attracted historically much less attention in the United States than it has elsewhere, most notably in Europe. This neglect is quite remarkable given the extreme levels of inequality that have long characterized US income distribution. Of late, however, this anomaly has been unraveling. Today, some of the most crucial, timely, and contested questions concern the economic effects of inequality. We are grateful to have this opportunity to pose a set of questions about that subject to two of the world's most distinguished economists, Professors Tony Atkinson and Paul Krugman, and we are honored to have as a moderator the accomplished economic journalist, Christia Freeland. Let me now introduce Janet Gornick. She is Professor of Political Science and Sociology at the Graduate Center and Director of the Luxembourg Income Study Center. She will say a few words about LIS, provide some logistical information, and introduce our speakers. Please welcome Janet Gornick. Good evening. Thank you, President Kelly. I am indeed Janet Gornick, Director of LIS, a cross-national data center in Luxembourg, in the country of Luxembourg, with a satellite office here at the Graduate Center. Very quickly, I'm going to tell you what LIS does. It's a question we're always asked. Uh, in short, we gather data sets from around the world, now from nearly 50 countries, and we harmonize them into a common database so that researchers and policymakers can use them for comparative research. And I'm happy to say that many do exactly that. Since our founding in the early 1980s, several thousand researchers have used our data. Most of this research has been aimed at understanding the nature and the institutional underpinnings of income inequality, of poverty, and of labor market disparities. As President Kelly noted, the Graduate Center is committed to strengthening and extending research uh, related to inequality and to raising the public visibility of that work, and all of us at LIS uh, in our office in Luxembourg and here at the Graduate Center are thrilled to be working with our colleagues here to build this inequality initiative. Before I introduce the evening and our speakers, I want to uh, indeed give a few logistics. Tonight's event is being live streamed. And if you haven't already, on your way out, please stop at the information table. We have some information there uh, from LIS. We have a brochure. We have a graph that we produced uh, that shows inequality across 25 rich countries, which we put there to help set the context. And the website uh, for our uh, data and our um, institution is available there. And also, please take a moment to stop 
at the book table, where you, if you haven't had a chance already, where you'll find for sale Tony Atkinson's book, Top Incomes, A Global Perspective, uh, Paul Krugman's book, End This Depression Now, exclamation mark, and Christian Freeland's book, uh, Plutocrats. You'll also find an order form for an edited volume uh, that will be published in July, in July titled Income Inequality, uh, and that book, which I co-edited, gathers 17 commission studies uh, based on the list data, one of them co-authored by um, Tony Atkinson. So tonight we turn our attention to several intertwined questions about inequality, and these questions prompt us to ask the prior question, why do we care? Why does inequality matter? Many would argue that inequality, especially when it's high or rising, raises fundamental questions about equity and justice. From this perspective, extreme or increasing inequality is intrinsically unacceptable, especially against the backdrop of national affluence. The haves simply have too much relative to the have-nots. But a different set of concerns is currently capturing the attention of legions of scholars and political actors in the United States and abroad. And these concerns are mostly instrumental, meaning that we worry about inequality because of its effects. Uh, and from this vantage point, inequality is mainly problematic because it causes a range of undesirable consequences. And today, economists are at the forefront of this growing and lively public conversation last year. Joe Stiglitz helped to popularize the claim that inequality has a price. He argued that the consequences of inequality may intensify over time as vicious cycles take hold. Jamie Galbraith concurred, writing that increasing inequality is a warning sign that something is going wrong and a pretty good indicator throughout history that untoward developments may be on the horizon. An economist working from a more conventional perspective at the World Bank, the IMF, and the OECD are also assessing the possibility that inequality has harmful effects, and some have argued openly that the United States in particular is headed for trouble. This explosion of research and debate has focused on a set of crucial questions, the answers to which are all contested. The dominant questions are, does inequality harm economic growth? Does it cause economic instability and possibly catastrophic economic crises? And does it thwart intergenerational mobility? That is the likelihood that young people will rise above the economic circumstances of their parents. And in addition, many economists are joining their colleagues in other disciplines by asking, does inequality corrode the political process and ultimately democracy itself? And tonight, as Bill Kelly noted, we're immensely grateful that Tony Atkinson and Paul Krugman, aided by Christian Freeland, will share their views on these th three crucial questions and ultimately will help us to separate fact from fiction. Tony Atkinson from Oxford University is routinely described as the world's foremost scholar of the economics of inequality. He's an author or editor of more than 30 books and a mountain of articles on inequality and related topics. He's received honors from around the world, too numerous to mention, not the least of which is becoming a knight of the British Empire in 2000. Tony Atkinson's influence on inequality can't be overstated, and nor can his legendary generosity. In any room in Europe that contains more than one economist, he's simply Tony, no last name needed, it's obvious. He's the man who's trained a generation of inequality scholars and has supported and enriched research institutions and data structures all over Europe and beyond. At LIS, we proudly claim him as our board president, an honor that raises our aspirations. Paul Krugman from Princeton University is the author or editor of over 20 books and an unimaginable number of articles. He too has received countless honors, including in 1991, the John Bates Clark Medal uh, and in 2008, the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Many of us have benefited from his scholarship, but the fact is that most of us know him best uh, as the author of a bi-weekly column in the New York Times, and he's, I think that's true, he's now undoubtedly the foremost economic and political commentator in the United States. As I told him some time ago, I think his most admirable trait is his uncanny capacity never to lose his cool or his train of thought when Mary Madeline regularly insults him on ABC's this week with George Stephanopoulos. <coughs> Paul Krugman has also been generous to Liss. In 2010, he graced us with a three-day visit to Luxembourg, and I had the pleasure of serving as host. Luxembourg's national leaders came out in droves, including the conservative prime minister, who engaged him in a lengthy chat about the wisdom of austerity policies in Europe. That was colorful, I promise you that. <laughs> His visit attracted more attention in Luxembourg than any economic event since the introduction of the Euro. Uh, rivaled, <laughs> rivaled only by the announcement that Tony Atkinson had agreed to become Liss's board president. Both Tony uh, Atkinson and Paul Krugman have helped to raise Liss's star, and all of us at Liss are really grateful to them for signaling their confidence in the work that we do. 
Krista Freeland is currently Managing Director and Editor of Consumer News at Thomson Reuters. She has a long and exceptional career in economic journalism and is most recently the author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Glo Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. Plutocrats, a bestseller, has garnered a tremendous number of honors, uh, and if I may say so, it's a marvelous read, uh, if sometimes a galling read. Um, and conventional accolades aside, I was introduced to Krista Freeland through her many appearances on Real Time with Bill Maher. Uh, and clearly, if she can handle Bill Maher and his unruly cast of characters, she'll do well with Tony Atkinson and Paul Krugman. <laughs> so Krista, I turn it over to you. Mm. Okay, well... Uh Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Um, sadly for me, though, Tony and Paul are much more intellectually intimidating than the people on The Bill Maher Show. So uh, a much higher challenge. And uh, just to give you a sense of what a treat we're all in for tonight, I think people would agree with me that Paul Krugman is not a person who we often see as being tongue-tied or starstruck but he did confess in the green room just a few minutes ago that he felt a bit abashed about saying anything at all about inequality in the presence of Tony, um, exactly. who really is um, you know, the father of this whole field and has been working on it you know, at a time when it was a lot less trendy than it is today. Um, the final reason that I think we're really in for a treat tonight is you know, we are going to hear from two really towering and brave intellects they're also both economists who have a real popular touch. And to give you a sense of that, I read back through some of Tony's papers to get ready for tonight. And I was particularly struck by how he framed one of his concluding sections to a paper on income inequality around the structure of the novel Happenstance by Carol Scheel, uh, a favorite of mine. I'm Canadian, too. That doesn't happen that often in economic papers. And Paul, we of course know, has a fantastic uh, mm. popular touch. Uh, and to give you just a quick snapshot of that, if you went through his blog, as I do several times a day, you would notice in the past 72 hours, he has shared with us a picture of a beaver dam as an example of infrastructure projects, uh, <laughs> and also a clip of a Suzanne Vega concert. So there you go. Um, so this is, I think, really the most important question of our time, and it's also really complicated. And I thought that a great way to start would be to ask Tony to set the stage for us. Tell us what is happening with income inequality, and maybe give us a little bit of a global sense of where we are and, and what's been happening in the past few decades. Thank you. Um, I must say, I've never seen the Bill Maher show, so I don't quite know what comparison. Uh, don't, <laughs> what, don't, what be too, don't be too flattered. Don't okay. be too flattered. Uh, right, thank you. I, I found myself paired with John Waters, which was really quite interesting. <laughs> anyway, to take up um, your, your challenge, I, I, I share your view that this is a very uh, important and pressing problem. Um, but perhaps we should just start with some good news. And there is some good news in this, which is that it's not universally the case that inequality is increasing. There are some areas of the world, notably at the moment uh, Latin America. In fact, I think every single country in Latin America has seen a decrease in inequality in the last 10 years, which is rather staggering. It's also, and that re reflects us, that uh, it's also globally the case that we've seen in the last uh, 10, 15 years some narrowing of the large gaps there are between rich and poor countries. So globally, in some respects, we're actually seeing perhaps a return uh, or a closing of the big divergence that took place during the Industrial Revolution and led to this enormous disparities between uh, developing countries and rich countries. So there's some good, some good news. But there's also, <laughs> there's also a lot of buts. Uh, and I think the buts are that in most uh, rich countries uh, in the last... 30 years or so, we have seen income inequality, uh, that is inequality in terms of what people earn and what they receive from their investments and what they get from the government and pay in taxes, all these things taken into account. Income inequality has been uh, increasing in most countries, not entirely, not all countries. There are some countries, even in the OECD, some of the continental European countries have not seen such an increase, but it has it's very significantly increased, and particularly, of course, in the United States. 
I should say also has increased in my own country, uh, United Kingdom, more than has the United States. I sometimes think of Britain as being a little microcosm, as it were, of the United States, but actually uh, we've seen a bigger increase in inequality. Well done. Well done, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I, all I can have claimed to have contributed to it was to study it. I, I'm not in a sense responsible, although it is true that ever since I, ever since I started working, I, I wrote my first book on poverty in 1969, and since then poverty has doubled. And uh, it's not a, a terribly good record. I think at the same time we should recognize also that it's inequality uh, which affects different parts of the, of the population. Uh, and although it, over so the 1980s and 90s, the change was very much at the bottom of the income distribution, that is, uh, particularly the wages of people near the bottom were being uh, affected adversely by trade and by uh, comp competition from other countries and by technical change, making people redundant. That's a process which actually, to some extent, is not, I think, carried on in, in most countries. What has happened is that the other end of the scale, the top end, is where the process has carried on. So the increasing inequality is now very much a top phenomenon. Okay, so Paul, if you could comment on what Tony has said, and also specifically, you know, he sort of concluded with something you've written about a lot, which is both, you know, the hollowing out of the middle class and also the pulling away of the very top. Oh. Where is the action and what's going on in those spaces? So, yes, so there are two... Actually, I, I would just, by the way, second. My, I used to, the, obviously, the, the two great English-speaking cities of the world are, are London and, and this place. And, uh, and I used to um, feel, in some ways, that London was more of a place for ordinary people. And now I feel that New York is more of a place for ordinary people. London just seems too, too much uh, a rentier city of, of the global elite. And although New York is, there was a story in the Times today about, about the, the uh, the, the vast empty off, um, residence buildings for, for the global super, super wealthy. Nonetheless, New York is now more of a middle class city than London, which is a very remarkable thing. Um, so two things are happening. And I think they're, they're actually quite, they're, they're distinct. They're not exactly the same story. Uh, but I think they're both very problematic. One is that the middle class. And, and you know, nobody knows what middle class means. We don't have a formal definition. But we do have some sense of what that ought to be. It ought to be a certain amount of security a sense that you can get by, that it's uh, that that you can afford, to, you know, that that you your children will get decent education, that you'll receive the necessary health care that you need when when it's required. That that basically you're not living on the edge, and very clearly there's a sharp drop in the fraction of the population that feels that way, that has that kind of status. More and more people in this country, I think less so in the UK, in part because of, of universal health care, uh, although which we're sort of kind of getting at the end of this year. Uh, um, but but even there, but certainly the sense that that you're living on the edge, that one thing goes wrong, one spouse loses a job, one one, one illness, that 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 you fall off the edge, or or simply that you can't you cannot count on your local public high school to provide decent education. That that status has been eroding, and that's that's one end of it. Um, the other is this super elite, which um, you might say, why do we care? Is it just pure envy? And aside from the fact that it's a, it's a pretty significant amount of income that's siphoned off, that if you look at economic growth, I think it also it, it warps our society. It warps our, our priorities. And this gets into these issues of, of, uh, of ultimately political economy. How much does it matter that, that so much of the influence in our society lies in the hands of a handful of people who live in a material universe that's simply beyond the comprehension of 99, you know, you, the, the, Occupy Wall Street had it wrong, right? It's not the, it's not the 1%, it's the 0.1% or the 0.01%. And, and that's, got, this, that's got to be a, something that's going to disturb you if you worry about, you know, if you have a kind of a democratic ideal of what kind of society we're supposed to be. Should it disturb us, Tony? Well, it certainly disturbed um, Plato, who said that right. the maximum distance between the top and the bottom should be four to one. It's not quite fair, because he wasn't counting slaves, so it was just... And was he counting like, women? Right. Did women count for so Plato? Uh, we'll I come to that, that in a moment, yes. <laughs> but anyway, it gives you a sense that you know, four to one, it obviously would be quite hard to imagine that happening today. But I think what I, I agree very much with what Paul said just now about the connection between these, that is... Uh, 
the fact, I mean, I think it was well put by uh, the historian Tawney in England uh, when he said that uh, what thoughtful rich people call the problem of poverty, thoughtful poor people call the problem of riches. And these two things are interconnected. And I think that particularly when it comes to, as you say, issues about the quality of public provision, of public schooling, and other things, it is the ability to opt out of that, which actually have meant that there is, it, there's less political pressure to maintain the quality of services and the guarantee of services. And then in this way, that our lives are bound up together, even though we may be very separated in terms of gated communities and other things which separate people off. So, Paul, does, does Tony's point about this ability to opt out maybe go some way towards answering a question that you've been asking a lot, which is why do the Austerians continue to push for austerity? And why, okay. do, some, why do we get some of these sort of points made that I think you would argue from a technical economic standpoint are just wrong? What, why are these arguments okay. raised? Is it because from the point of view of the 0.1% actually they serve that vested interest? Okay, so for, for those who are new to this or you know, not, have not uh, read the uh, 377 columns I've written about this in the past year. Um, you can all recite those columns, right. Paul. Um, you know, clearly uh, we, we've had this uh, amazing push in the midst of a, what is, what is a, a depression in, in the advanced world? It's, it's not a, the Great Depression. You know, the, I've been saying, I, I thought that should have been Obama's re-election slogan. Not as bad as the Great Depression. Um, the, um, but, but it's clearly a, a depression. Um, this push to cut back, to cut back on government spending, to, to retrench, to, to worry about debt, even if you're able to borrow at negative real interest rates. So, and one obvious question is how much of that is, is because the relevant class, the people involved, are, are either unaffected by or maybe even benefiting from, from the Depression. Um, and it's clear that, that they certainly are not much affected. That if we look at top incomes, they have recovered very smartly from the, from the financial crisis. That if we look at corporate profits, which ultimately, if you ask you know, who, who are the ultimate claimants on corporate profits, it's going to be this very largely a, a small number of people at the top. They've, they're at record levels. Um, now, I guess I don't believe there are a lot of, uh, of um, self-conscious villains there. I don't think... It's there, not guys there, in dark rooms smoking cigars and... I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are some of those, right? Uh, you know, uh, the Koch brothers maybe, but the... Uh, um, <laughs> but the um, we are live. I'm aware. <laughs> if, they, if they don't have it in for me already, they, they, uh, they're, they're not doing their job. Um, the, um, uh, but for the most part, I think it's more just that, that there is this divorce of, of, of experience. That if you are, in fact, one, I mean, I'm sometimes in those rooms, you know, the, the bunch of men with, with great tailors uh, sitting around a, a base covered table with water bottles in front of them, that, that you and your friends are not feeling a lot of hardship in this, and you are thinking, sound fiscal policy. We've got to worry about the debt. And, uh, and well, of course, you know, these, these entitlement programs, they, they're, they, they look excessively generous. Um, and, and I don't think we would be having anything like the discussion we're having if we did not already have a society in which so much wealth and so much power is concentrated in the hands of this group that is pretty much insulated from the disaster that the rest of the population is experiencing. Tony, does that group deserve to have so much wealth and power concentrated in its hands? <laughs> well, I think as uh, in fact, Janet's earlier discussion brought out clearly that there, there are two sets of considerations. One is the, the consequences, and therefore thinking through whether that has a, a kind of effects we've just been talking about. But the other is the notion of what would be a, a, a socially just society. And I think that's something which I'm sure everyone in this room has probably a different view. I mean, this is something we can discuss and probably disagree about. But I think the kind of reasons why it concerns me is that the, the nature of your society does depend on the extent of differences between people. And that, therefore, that for, if they extend to such a sense that we no longer feel a sense of common purpose or cohesion, then I think that ceases then to be an effective society. I, 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 this is something I actually 
think of, I think it's important to to clarify our thoughts a little bit, and it's something I've tried to think about. So, the, what, what do we mean by deserve? Or what you know, what are the different meanings? So, one question would be just some kind of notion of natural right. And one of the things about blogging is you get to read, not too often, but get to read the comments. Um, and you get a, there's a fair number of people who basically say, what's mine is mine, and anything else, um, progressive taxation, is taking away my things at the point of a gun. And uh, there's really no way to argue. Well, there are ways to argue with that. You can say, look, we all live in a, in a, in a society, and this is the famous Obama, you didn't build that remark. He was saying, you know, that road, you didn't build that. He wasn't saying that you didn't deserve, you didn't build your business. Um, but that's a, that's, that, that is a very difficult point to argue with. There's a second question, which is, uh, are the activities that have made some people so wealthy actually socially productive activities? And the thing that London and New York have in common is that a lot of the wealth that these two cities have is built upon gigantic financial industries that whose main, you know, the, 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 this, is, this is the old uh, joke, right? That name me a financial innovation of all this financial innovation that, that's generated all this wealth. Name me a financial innovation that has unambiguously been beneficial and you're not allowed to count the ATM. Oh, that's right. right. That's <laughs> we were all uh, going to say the ATM. Um, and so there, there's a real question, how much of this wealth has been generated by stuff that's at best um, dubious and quite possibly socially destructive? And then there's a third question, which is optimal. Uh, I'm almost afraid to mention this. It's only Atkinson here. But the, um, with, uh, from some kind of social welfare point of view, what is, is optimal? And, uh, um, and here, I, I will say, I, I, I read my colleague Peter Diamond, who says, what, if we try to think about it from the point of view of some abstract social you know, a, a philosopher king, trying to set tax rates on the ultra-wealthy, um, that philosopher king should care not at all about the income of the wealthy per se, because they already have so much that the marginal utility of a dollar is essentially zilch. Uh, we should only care really about extracting the maximum revenue from them, in which case the, the top marginal tax rate should be the one that maximizes revenue, which, to make a you know, vague, rough guess, would be 73%. According to Peter, but anyway, uh, but but that but all of all, all of those perspectives, I think, except the first one, uh, would suggest I don't know that the wealthy don't deserve their wealth. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means, but but that we would be a better society if they were not so wealthy. If we did things that, through some combination of financial regulation and higher top tax rates, reduce their wealth. Okay, so Tony, please comment, and could you comment on something that I think maybe you get in your comments, Paul, in that first category, um, which is also this notion that, okay, you actually need the inequality to have an innovative society, to have a society where you have entrepreneurs who are willing to go out and risk greatly, they must be rewarded greatly to have that. And the, the evidence on that is mixed, should we say. Um, mixed or mixed, negative? Mi Mixed, I would say. I, I was just recently reading a very interesting article about the question, which is discussed perennially, as to why Britain had the Industrial Revolution. And this article int interestingly argued that, in fact, one of the things that Britain had, and I, I hadn't really thought about, was it had the most developed form of poor law at the time. And that this had meant that people were able to take risks with the guarantee that they'd have something to live on. And they gave, just gave examples of various well-known in, in inventions in the cotton industry and other industries, which were eventually were poor craftsmen, for whom if, the, if it failed, there was actually something to live on, which was not true in most other countries at that time. So universal health care should help entrepreneurship? Well, I, certainly universal uh, provision of, uh, of uh, guaranteeing a survival, yes. And, uh, I think this is an aspect we often t tend to lose sight of. The welfare state is actually partly a, a way of sharing risks, which is actually so benefits the rest of society, not just the person. But, uh, it allows people to take risks in terms of, say, occupational choice or setting up a business or something, which if you've got something to fall back on, the government is sharing part of the risk with you. So that's an example why I, I, it's not at all clear to me that there's any uh, negative effects from that kind of redistribution. 
You know, I think there, there's, a, there's always a question of, uh, of you know, where on the curve we are. I think if we, we would probably all agree that, that Cuba is, uh, or Cuba as it was, I don't know what's going on now, but uh, that, that an attempt and absolute leveling will destroy incentives. Uh, but yes, uh, very much. Um, Dean Baker uh, at, at the Center for Economic Policy Research likes to point out that we, we, we worship small business here. We talk about small business all the time. But actually, there are a lot more small businesses small business people in Europe than here. And that, that has a lot to do with the fact that there is a safety net and that there is health care. And, and it's actually it's very dangerous. I mean, I, I personally know quite a number of people who reluctantly work for large corporations. They'd really rather be on their own, but they need that damn health plan. So to take your 73% ideal top tax rate, and I'll ask you in a minute, Tony, if you, if you have a different number in mind. Um, how enforceable is that in a highly globalized economy in which taxation happens nationally, but capital and capitalists live in an international space and could do, as, as many of the French have been saying, just decide to move somewhere else or like Starbucks and Amazon and Google, just not pay too many taxes in lots of countries? So my understanding is the number of French celebrities who said that they're going to move is a lot larger than the number who actually have. Um, <laughs> Um, and, um, and actually, I believe if we could just crack down on, on the British with their business with the domicile and the, um, Lon London as a tax haven is actually a pretty significant part of this. And if we could just stop that, um, um, it, it's, you know, there, there's a lot of, there is, uh, there's a lot of tax avoidance. Uh, going on in, in the world, um, centering on uh, places, uh, well, uh, like Cyprus, just uh, until, until the other day and so on. But it's, it's actually, it's a known set of places. It's not, if, if the major OECD, if the G7 countries decided that we're not going to let this happen, it would stop happening. So the, it, it's not that there's a global elite that can't be policed. It's that there's a global elite that has enough influence on major governments to ensure that it is not policed. True or false? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've had, we have seen quite a lot of progress on disclosure, for example, partly unintended disclosure by people inadvertently revealing information. But nonetheless, that, that I think has changed very much. But on the other hand, I do agree with Paul that we could exercise more pressure and one wonders how far in fact the OECD countries are serious about it and that each, each, of us, each of us countries has its own particular tax havens. Do you agree with Paul that 73% would be a good upper level? Uh, should we say, I, we've been having a debate in the United Kingdom about this. Uh, which is interesting, the, the Conservative government put it in exactly the terms that Paul described. That is, they said this is a question of raising revenue, it's not a question of they attach, like you, no weight to the fact of the incomes of the top group. They argued that the revenue maximizing rate was, I think, uh, 40, 40%. I think that's a miscalculation. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's a miscalculation because it uh, doesn't recognize um, the fact that uh, much of the income, for example, is not spent on goods that are taxed, which they assume it's all going to be paid on spent on goods on which you pay value-added tax at 20%. It assumes that you're, you're going to be paying full social insurance contributions. This is all assuming the income essentially is earning, that it's in your salary, uh, whereas, of course, most of the income is not salary. It's in other forms which pay lower taxes. And therefore, I think the correct answer, which uh, they should have come up with, is more like 60%. 60. So you're lower than Paul. Well, I, well, I, I, uh, I say I think... That's what the government's own logic would produce. And, and it's also true that there is, there is some international leakage. So the level that would make sense for the UK is probably, you, acting unilaterally is going to be lower than for no. the US. And of course, substantially lower than for the OECD sort of collectively deciding what it's going to do here. So it, it's, I mean, I don't think the, you know, these, this is not, this is, these are not hard numbers. Uh, Christy Romer says 80, right? It's uh, based, based on some, some real work, but you know, it, it I think the, for the U.S., the point is clearly higher than we are now. Precisely. That's exactly the point. The other point I'd make is, of course, we do need to essentially to have, to begin to move to a global tax regime. That is, basically, the idea of nation states trying to tax is really out of date. Is, is that at all plausible? 
Well, not, not global US, governments. Not, not in the US uh, Congress, I don't think, but. Uh, I, no, that's okay. We'll just get the, uh, the Cincinnati office of the IRS. We'll get some, high, some black helicopters to go after you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a little bit too topical. Um, no, it, it's, but look, I mean, we could, the point is, I think, actually, to, you don't necessarily have to have global governance as long as the, the major countries are at least vaguely coordinating. If, mm, if the UK mm. and the US and the Germans who would, and the French and uh, if the Italians ever do have a government, uh, would all they have, a government. <laughs> they have a government of sorts. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not it's not that hard for us to 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 move to substantially collecting substantially more. It, it, it's not going to. That's not the whole story. But clearly, the, we could be raising more revenue from the super elite than we are right now, and uh, we could use the money. Yeah. And it's also not a question simply of individuals. It's really, it's really corporations. That's it's much more so. important than, than in some ways than individuals. And we are moving to harmonizing various ways, very slowly. So I think one day we shall have a world tax organization, which really can't be called that. It has to be called World Tax Authority or something, because we've got a WTO already. But right. so there will be something like that soon. Which, which enforces certain laws on taxes and well, not rules. Necessarily, not necessarily having common rates, but has common ways of assessing income, for example, to make sure that you can't. Well, the European Union has quite a lot of stuff like that already, mm -hmm. VAT. There, there are minimums on VAT. Yes, yes. But don't we actually, in real life, also see the opposite tendency of arguments being made in countries about how you know we have to keep, to take corporate tax, we have to keep our corporate tax rates at a certain level to avoid our companies going to another country or even another state? I, I was actually just on uh, Irish radio uh, this afternoon, and they were talking a bit about, you know, if what um, mustn't we, uh, you know, if, if there's closer European political integration, won't this reduce our ability to offer these tax incentives, which it would, mm -hmm. but what they get from those tax incentives is actually a lot less than what they think they get. They get a lot of businesses that essentially hang out a nameplate in Ireland and maybe do a little bit of activity, but actually generate remarkably little in the way of actual jobs or value added in Ireland. And there's a lot of that illusion. The same thing happens with US states. A lot of state governments go to great lengths in an attempt to attract businesses, and if you actually try to do the cost benefit, they are, they, they are, they are shooting themselves in the foot. It's, so I think just better information can help quite a lot here. A professor's hope, anyway. That's right. Uh, um, we, al we always like to fantasize that better information will help, although I have to admit most of, most of the evidence of experience runs the other way. Um, now, Tony, in talking about the British debate about taxes, mm. you talked about assumptions about how much of their income the wealthy would consume, which is part of this question that Janet set us up with at the beginning about what is the relationship between inequality and growth. And there have been people starting to make the argument um, that actually, you know, even setting aside these issues of social cohesion, even setting aside these issues of raising revenue for the state, that too much inequality is bad for growth because you don't have the middle class having enough income to be a consumption engine that the economy needs. Do you buy that? I think the, um, the problem ran away with um, discussing the determinants of growth is we actually, the truth is that we don't really understand what determines economic growth. That's the first problem. But it's also the case that I think the, if you look at the last the post-war period, uh, there really haven't been enormous differences in growth rates. And there have been periods when certain countries pull ahead. There was a German economic miracle. There was Japan. I mean, Japan was the most successful right. economy. Uh, the United States in the last few years. But in a sense, if you look over the whole post-war period, the difference in the sort of ranking of the countries has hardly changed very much over this period. And the United Kingdom has productivity is 80% of that of the United States in 1950, and it's 80% today or something. I mean, it's, we've essentially grown in parallel. So if there's a strong connection between inequality, which we know to be different in different countries, it should have shown up either way. It should either have shown up that unequal countries grew faster, or vice versa. So I'm a bit agnostic about this. You're, you're worse than agnostic on this, Paul, right? Like, you've actually said it's possible to have economic growth with just the rich buying lots and lots of yachts. They could yeah, work. It, it's, uh, 
so there, there are a couple of things. Certainly, I mean, arithmetically, that's possible. And look, I mean, we did have, um, as best I can make out, of course, the, the data are terrible, but the, the two great eras of pretty fast growth in the United States over the long term are, roughly speaking, 1870 to 1914 or thereabouts, maybe with 20s as we can, I think are, are uh, arguable, and, um, and 1947 to 1973. And the first period was one of extreme inequality, the Gilded Age, and the second was one of remarkable equality, what's the, the, the America I grew up in. Um, what do you learn? Uh, both, both seem to be viable models. Uh, now, if you ask the question, uh, so there was, there was this debate, uh, it was odd, debate between me and Joe Stiglitz, right. um, which was not really about long-term economic growth, but just about business cycle. And the question was, is the extreme concentration of income in the hands of a few people, is that holding back consumer spending? And, and Joe had some good points about why that might be the case. Um, my problem would be that consumer spending as a share of income remains quite high by historical standards. So you don't get, it's, it's hard to make this story that we have inadequate consumer spending because of inequality. But we do have, if you, if you want to do an overlay, if you want to do a chart, of um, top 1% share of income versus ratio of household debt to income for the United States since World War II, you will find that they match almost exactly. That in 1980, there's a break point where the top 1% takes off and household debt takes off at the same time. And we do think that household debt is a pretty critical part of what's gone wrong with our economy now. So what's your story? Did uh, Reaganite policies, including financial deregulation, lead to a simultaneous explosion of household debt and income inequality? Did income inequality rising through consumption cascades uh, lead to middle class families going deeper and deeper into debt in an attempt to buy houses in good school districts? That's the Elizabeth Warren story. Don't know the answer. How about the to Raghu that. Rajan? That all of that sort of happens, the political accommodation to rising income inequality. No, actually, uh, that's that that of of the various stories, that's the one that turns out to be entirely wrong because Raghu Rajan tells the story, which is basically that Barney Frank somehow forced banks to make loans to unqualified borrowers as a response to income inequality, and it just isn't there in the data. It's it's the uh, Community Reinvestment Act did not lead to a lot of that lending. Fannie and Freddie did not do a lot of subprime lending until the very, very end of the process. So no, actually, uh, uh, that, that's, that of, of the various stories, we, there, there, I guess there are three main stories out there, and that's the one that's definitely wrong. The other two, I don't know. And Tony, do you see this connection? Well, I think Paul's quite careful to say it was association rather than connection. In a sense, it's, right. it's, it's, it was a coincidence, as my, my view, there's quite a lot of common things. Uh, to just take the case of the United Kingdom, which um, obviously I know better, I think there it was a coincidence of policies which, for example, uh, were particularly those involved cutting back on state provision of pensions, uh, which our pension system is much worse than the old age and survivors insurance now. And as a result of that, that's one of the things that drove the growth of the financial services sector because basically people were on their own in terms of making their own personal personal pension provision. And it was therefore led to the expansion of the financial services industry, but also it led to an investment in housing for income, that is buying houses to let out, which for many people was the main source of their potential pensions. And of course these things two together, they were, as it were, it was a policy which was carried out by a government which did other things like the cutting back state pensions which raised inequality but also had the same effect of generating some of the conditions that led to the financial crisis. So these, I think, is a story of coincidence rather than in any sense of causal connection. By the way, I just, just for the American audience, I, following the UK pensions retirement debate is an amazing thing because you have all this, first of all, made, made a total hash of it. Uh, Thatcher really, 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 really messed up there. And then you read the reports and they say, you know, let's look around the world for models. And where is there a model of a really well-designed pretty fiscally sound retirement system. And it's this thing called Social Security in the United States. <laughs> yes. Is that true? <laughs> you, you yearn for US style I'm, Social Security? We would be better off if we had it, actually. <laughs> uh, 
but yeah. Um, so moving into another area where people are starting to talk a lot about the potential malign impacts of rising income inequality is social mobility. What is really going on there? What kind of a connection do we know exists? Do we know anything about that at all? Yeah, I think it's, it's good you brought that up because I, we're talking about inequality because inequality is partly in terms of outcomes. We've been talking about people's incomes and their wealth and their earnings. But most people, I think, uh, think that inequality of opportunity is another very important dimension. And so some people, it's probably the thing they care most about. Uh, so therefore, I think we have to first of all ask us how much uh, opportunity there is and how much uh, mobility there is that therefore, therefore allows between people in terms of their movement across generations for one generation to have better opportunities than their, their parents. And of course, the evidence there suggests that the United States and to some extent the United Kingdom, the Anglo-Saxon countries, are, it turns out, considerably less mobile intergenerationally than continental Europe or particularly the Scandinavian countries. Okay, so, so Paul, can this possibly be true? America, no, no, land of opportunity, land of the American dream, worse than old Europe? Uh, I mean, this has been apparent. It's, uh, no, I shouldn't say that uh, we were talking before. Tony says, Tony says the, the data are terrible, right? That this is something that we don't have, have not collected lots of information on. But, but the, the sense that it's true has been there for, for quite a while. This is not news. And, uh, um, and our image of ourselves as a society, an upwardly mobile society is um, at least a generation out of date, probably more than that. And, it, it's, uh, and you can, it's not hard to think of why, right? Uh, public schools are, are of highly uneven quality. Um, the amount of, of resources it requires to get ahead in the world is, uh, is, uh, is, is the, the cliff becomes higher. And so the, the, um, uh, my colleague, Alan Kruger, uh, uh, currently uh, wasting his time instead of at Princeton uh, advising the president on economic policy, um, is, has this thing he calls the Great Gatsby Curve, which that shows, again, correlation, not causation. But there is, in fact, a strong correlation between current level of income inequality and lack of intergenerational social mobility. Um, so sure, um, this is, this is uh, you, you wonder how much uh, the legend of, of, of American social mobility. I, mean, what, I think it's partly the immigrant experience. So, the, so part of, of even, even we, we were never as socially mobile as we, as we thought we were. It's just that so many of us came from, you know, from, uh, from uh, uh, villages in southern Italy and shtetls in, in, uh, in Belarus and, and, uh, and, and made that change. But still, something clearly. We, we are less mobile now, uh, clearly. It's just so much harder to, come back to lack of middle class, it's so much harder to make a decent opportunity for your children unless you happen to already be born into the right circumstances. Are you willing to go so far as to say this is causation, not just correlation, Tony? Yeah. Well, Take a risk. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think the, uh, the causation, well, the fact that we're observing this immobility, I mean, is, of course, it's also connected with what we've just been talking about. That is, we're concerned about inequality of opportunity because of the unequal rewards that there are. So we have to go back to the things we've already been talking about. If, in fact, everyone was paid much the same as whatever job they chose to do, given allowing for the cost of education, then, of course, we wouldn't be so worried about this. It's because the prizes for doing well have become so unequal that we're actually so concerned about it. But also, it's quite the fact that prizes have become so unequal means that the access to those occupations has also become harder, and as Paul said, you have to climb further. But I would just emphasize that it's actually very much an issue at the bottom rather than the top, because mobility has sort of two, two ends to it. And if, it turns out that in Scandinavia, it's not much harder. It's much, it's, it's, um, people at the top tend to stay there as much as people in the United States stay there. It's the other way around, it's at the bottom. They have to, they have to go down gradually. Whereas what happens at the, in the bottom is it's much harder to go up from the bottom of the United States to the top. There's that extraordinary study, which I'm sure you know, and I'm just dra dragging it out of the depths of my imperfect memory about uh, something about Swedish uh, surnames. You can actually, uh, by, by looking at names, you can tell 
people who were aristocratic centuries ago. And they still tend to be heavily overrepresented in the upper classes now. So it, it is this uh, amazing thing that, that you're right, that even, even in Scandinavia, the, the super elite tends to remain the super elites. But, but to make it to upper middle class status uh, in, it has become quite hard in the United States if you don't start close to that point. It was a few years ago, we had a prime minister who was the 14th Earl of Hume, which suggests his family had been around for a while. Yes. But what about, what about the meritocrats within the super elite? What about the Mark Zuckerberg? The, the what, sorry? The Mark Zuckerberg. Is there, you know, in these kind of winner-take-all races, is there some sort of point at which getting those, you know, very extreme prizes is actually correlated not just with your social class, but with your talent, your luck? Well, of course. But I mean, it, that's, uh, uh, you know, I, I but we, those, those are the people who make headlines precisely because it's, it's unusual, right? So the, the, uh, the uh, God, it's been a while. My, my, my former colleague, Peter Tenman, was looking mm -hmm. at, at CEOs of, of uh, US corporations, and they, they are about who you would expect, right? They, so there will be a few who are, who are you know, amazing rags to riches stories, but by and large, they are white males from upper middle class or higher backgrounds, the, the whole thing. And it's, it's, so I think that's, that's still going to be very much true. It's, it's going to be, um, uh, it's, it's like you know, sports stars, are going to be very interesting, remarkable people and with, with remarkable stories, but there really aren't very many of them. And there are an awful lot of executives making vast sums of money whom you've never heard of, who have utterly conventional backgrounds and are in many cases uh, not very interesting people. And in a fair number of cases, at least based on casual conversation, not all that smart, uh, but, uh, but, but were in the right place and had the right background. Um, so, Tony, Paul has uh, just referred to white males, mm. and when we spoke about Plato, as one does, uh, you said we would get to gender later on. Mm. So, how does gender figure into all of this? Yes. Speaking I, as a person of gender. Right. <laughs> yes, I had noticed. Yes. <laughs> um, the, um, a bit of my homework for preparing for this, I did look at what had happened to male and female wages in the last uh, 10 years. And the ratio of full-time, full-year uh, workers uh, has gone from 76% women earning of men has gone to 77% in 10 years, at which rate you can work out it's going to take more than two centuries to reach equality. And I think that's an indication that this issue, which was clearly very much on the agenda in the 1960s and 70s, and indeed certainly it was one of the things that happened uh, in many countries was that gap was narrowed quite a lot. I think that's come, it's gone off the agenda and there are a number of reasons why that's um, happening. I think it's particularly true at the top. I mean, the, the glass ceiling is, seems to operate. If you look at the proportion of people in the top 1% who are women is very small. It's, uh, well, actually, public, coming back to public services, childcare, just think about, think about the availability of state-sponsored childcare or lack thereof. That's going to make a huge difference in gender roles across countries. Um, you know, it's one of those things, we, again, we think of the United States as being the place of, of you know, we, we pioneered uh, women's rights or something, right? And we did, and, um, and I, actually, I always find it, it's, a, it's a shock. I, I, I often, I, I actually teach a class on, on welfare state economics once. I didn't, why am I doing this? But but uh, I'm having fun, and I'm at that stage of life where I can. Um, and the, um, uh, I always find the comparison with France remarkable, because if you ask me, what do you think is the, uh, among prime age workers, 25 to, to 54, what do you think is the relative employment participation of women in France versus the United States? And you would assume, well, it must be much higher here. No, it's identical. Hmm. And. Uh, and it, it, I'm sure that has to do, their ability to do that despite whatever differences in social values must have a lot to do with the provision of, of social services that we do not have in this country. They also spend about four times as much as we do on a school lunch, by the way, which has a lot of bearing on, on the quality of nutrition. Um, well, we know that kid who secretly blogged the horrors of his lunch at school, right? Um, one of my personal heroes. Um, so, Tony, what is 
the political impact of rising inequality? Um, well, I think, I think that varies from country to country, and that clearly, as an outsider, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised by your, for example, camp, political campaign financing laws. But uh, They're not mine. I'm Canadian, so right. I, I have no responsibility for yeah. it. Paul does. Right. It's all my fault. Anyway, but, so I think I suspect there, um, you know, countries are very different in that sense. And I, I think that in the case of the United Kingdom, it's probably much more to do with the control of the media than it is with funding political parties. I mean, that's, that's just not so important. So I think each country you have to look at and ask, and I'm not a political scientist, I should immediately say, and I think that's, that's something which political scientists are beginning to look at. I think it's clearly very important, but it's going to be very much a country-specific answer. A couple of things are going on here. Uh, one, one is the, you know, just the, the money, uh, the money in politics, although I, I I think that might be somewhat overrated now as an issue. Certainly this last election, what was striking was basically that both campaigns had enough money to, to completely saturate the airwaves. And, uh, and as it turned out, the role of money in politics may actually have, have hurt the Republicans because, the, uh, because it, it, uh, Sheldon Adelson could keep Newt Gingrich alive as a candidate much longer than was good for the GOP. You know, so that sort of thing happened. Um, what strikes me, what I see is the is the access issue. The fact of the matter is that men of great wealth, almost always men of great wealth, have access. They, they get into the room. And uh, particularly from the financial industry, not only do they get into the room, but they are, they tend to be impressive. Uh, whatever remarks I was making about CEOs, not true. Finance people are smart, they're funny, they're- Jamie Dimon. Uh, very impressive guy, right? Great head of hair. Um, and uh, that's also important. Uh, either, either great head, no, never mind. Um, the, um, the, um, and that, that has a role, th there was this great title of a book, uh, the, the, the Simon Johnson um, book, 13 Bankers, where there was something being proposed and the phone call was, I've got 13 bankers in the room here with the president saying we can't do this. And, uh, you know, and that's, that, and that's going to happen. They, they, these guys are going to, and they, the, the, Adam Smith writes about this, about the tendency to assume that because someone is important and wealthy that they must actually be someone who should command sympathy and, and all of that. And, and that's very, that, that, that role of access, that, that role of, of being taken seriously because you must be a serious person, otherwise how could you possibly be so rich, um, I think actually has a, a surprisingly large distorting effect on policy. So do you buy the sort of whole cognitive capture school of oh, thought? Very much. And, and, there, and the, there's, there, there is the revolving door. You know, and it is a little bit, um, look, look at how many, uh, I, I, I think the Obama administration by and large has its heart in the right place and has been doing a lot, you know, I've obviously been pretty harsh on some things, but, but look, at, look at, the, uh, at, at the revolving door, even, even of Obama administration officials going off and, and, uh, and taking jobs on Wall Street. Um, afterwards. That's got to have an impact. Again, not a lot of people twirling their mustaches and saying, mm, I'm going to really screw the consumers on this regulation because then I'll get a great job at Citigroup. But the, the thought that, that of where you're going to be four years later has got to have an impact on policy. You know, to take a slightly more positive <laughs> view, it does seem to me these... Paul can be depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things certainly becoming quite important, I think, in the UK is, is, sort of local, is um, internet organized campaigns, for example, which have actually are a way, you know, the most recent one was trying to stop uh, the use of chemicals which were killing the bee population. Right. And the, this was a European decision that was going to be taken that enough countries had already essentially indicated they were going to vote against the bees or all the chemical companies. And there were petitions in a number of countries, and they turned around, and it was thrown out. Well, I, I will say, I, I'm not entirely pessimistic. Actually, one of the things I will say about policy debates is that um, we, you know, we, have, we have an infrastructure of think tanks and all of that uh, on both sides now. It used to be that it was pretty much only on, on the conservative side, financed with vast gobs of money. Uh, and now there is a parallel or you know, somewhat, co uh, there is an infrastructure on the other side, a progressive think tank infrastructure, which is vastly less well-funded 
um, but can get its message out, largely thanks to the internet, so you don't have to have the blast faxes and all of the stuff that was happening. And for whatever reason, um, by and large, intellectually runs rings around the conservative side. That they're, they're actually not only, you know. And that mystifies you? Well, not, not, not that, I, not, not that I, I think they're right more often than not, but the fact that they're so much better at doing the job, which we can talk about, but I think actually part of the, not being so well funded may actually be an advantage. That there are, there, that the people who go to work for them are much more committed as opposed to being just careerists. And uh, so, no, the actual, the, 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 the quality of discussion on all of these issues, including the ones we're talking about right now, is actually much better than it ever has been in my lifetime. We're, we're actually having a better quality of, of discussion, better analysis, more rapid fire response. Um, even if I think that something like you know, the austerity policies were a terrible mistake, and which continues, we actually had a much better pushback on it intellectually than we would have had, I think, 10 years ago. Okay, I have one last question to ask you both, and then we'll throw it open to everybody else. So please get your questions ready. We have microphones here. I won't be rude when I go to my BlackBerry, and I'm the last person in the universe who has one. It will be <laughs> checking to see if people have sent questions on Twitter. Um, so my last question, um, Tony, and then to you, Paul, will be, um, you've made a, a real point, and you've been really careful about this, Tony, and sort of saying, you know, the world is not uniform. This is a story that varies very much country by country. Who is getting it right? Who is handling, you know, in some of your papers, you know, you've talked also about kind of, you know, these global economic forces that are global are affecting all of us. Um, which country is handling it really well? And, and maybe we could learn from that country. Yeah, well, I, th I think we actually we can learn from each other <laughs> since there are, I mean, for example, uh, uh, I'm, I've been engaged in discussions about uh, a European uh, action on to help uh, on unemployment benefit, uh, which, interestingly, was actually proposed when they first proposed the euro. They said this has to be accompanied by an unemployment benefit Europe-wide. Uh, they forgot about that, unfortunately. But I think we could learn there from the United States extended unemployment insurance, for example. I mean, I think we only have 26 weeks unemployment insurance in the UK. 26 weeks. I've forgotten what it is here, 78, or how many weeks do you have? Well, the US is normally 26, but it, we've had extensions. So exactly. But the extensions are going away fast. Oh, so right, okay. It, we, we, the you example, used to I'll, be able to learn from yeah, the Exactly, we, we could, that's just a good example where, uh, the other way around, I think the United States would perhaps think rather hard about what is a high priority in the European Union, which is, is child poverty. I mean, there's no doubt that now there's a political drive to try and reduce child poverty in the European Union. And things like child benefits, for example, which we pay universal income for children, investing in the future. Paid to mothers? Paid to mothers, a very good point, exactly. So I think that that's perhaps a message. No, it, I mean, it, I, I'm, not, it, I'm not being facetious. No, no, it is. Studies it, show it's much I, more effective. Our child benefit is paid to mothers, yes, absolutely, yeah. Indeed. And it does show that it has a different effect on what, what the money is spent on. So I think that's sort of Also, if you look at it, I mentioned Latin America earlier on. I mean, I think there again, some of this has been achieved by, for example, the, the kind of programs often linked to education, providing, again, family support uh, in Mexico, Brazil, other countries. I mean, these are clearly things we can learn from. And that's one reason why these highly unequal countries, in many cases, have become somewhat less unequal. It's funny. I was thinking there, there, there are the various variants the European caricature jokes, uh, you know, hell, hell being a German policeman and, and British cooks and all that, and, the, uh, the, um, and, and heaven being uh, British policemen and, and French cooks and all of that. Um, so it, on, in terms of, of pol social policies, the, I think heaven would be, different countries do things right. Heaven would be French healthcare, uh, American retirement security, um, Finnish education, I think we can go down the line. There, yep. There's a list of, yeah. of, of uh, you know, th we, we don't, it, countries. It, Who's taxation? Uh, not sure about that, actually. I'm not sure that anyone, I, you know, I'm not sure anyone does that right. Uh, but but there, yeah. the point is that, that it's, it's actually, you think, that you, you, you want to imagine that there are countries that get everything right, but actual social policies are, uh, are, are a patchwork. They, 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 they happen through a series of historical accidents. And in some cases, they lead to pretty 
effective clean solutions uh, that, uh, in countries where everything else is a mess, like our social security system, or, or they lead to mysteriously effective things like French healthcare, which somehow is extremely high quality at very low cost. And so we should all learn from each other. Okay, uh, that's a, a rousing final thought before we hit the questions. Please. Thank you. Thank you for a terrific discussion and great moderation so far. Um, I'm Kathleen Hayes. I work for Bloomberg Radio, so um, talk about these kinds of things frequently. Could, could you both perhaps just address a little bit more one thing I don't think was addressed, and maybe, a, maybe because you both dismiss it, dismiss it, but if you look in particular at the U.S. economy, and Paul, you mentioned that 47 to 73 was a time of prosperity and equality. We also, um, following that time is when we started to see more competition from China, a move to embrace this this new potential market for all our goods, of course, which turned out to be like the movie Mars Attacks. You know, you go to shake the hand, the president does, Jack Nicholson, and the, the, the Martian just zaps you. I mean, the Chinese have proved to be huge competitors more than buying our goods. And we can see what we did, that helped hollow out our manufacturing sector. So that's one trend. So we, we've had less of a middle class in part because of that manufacturing jobs, you didn't need a college education. Now, another trend that many people are embracing is robotics. At a time when people don't have jobs and we need to find jobs, we're gonna have these labor-saving robots. So how does that affect income inequality? What kind of policy do we need to address it? We, we tended to construct the uh, discussion about inequality in terms of one group of workers skilled and one group of workers unskilled, and the skilled workers were gaining and the unskilled workers were losing because of, sort of international trade. But actually, the issue may now be much more all workers potentially losing uh, as uh, capital becomes more important. And incidentally, my teacher in Cambridge, uh, James Mead, wrote a book in 1960 arguing exactly this. He, said, well, he called it automation. He didn't, he didn't identify that it was uh, going to be China or other things. But I think that he did identify, and he therefore raised the issue, as then the question becomes crucial as to who owns the capital and who gets the profits. If at that time, same time, as we've seen in many countries, the share of profits is going up. But that then raises crucial distributional issues, which are different from the ones we've tended to talk about so far. And, I mean, it does seem that that link between productivity and wages and even employment has broken down. So what can you do about that? Well, the, then the question is who gets the, well, the, the, the productivity. Is it a question then the distribution of national income between wages and profits? Yeah, and there, there's, a, there's a funny, um, and we f I, I f fell into it right now. There, we do tend to talk in the United States still as if all of the inequality issues involved earned income, um, skilled versus unskilled labor, and maybe then the super, the, you know, the, the hedge fund managers and, and CEOs. Um, which was pretty much true until about 2000, that there was not much change in the distribution between labor broadly defined and capital. But we have actually have now seen a substantial move of uh, shift of income away from labor in general towards capital, um, which may be, could be, could be with the robots, uh, could be increased monopoly power because we've also kind of let antitrust enforcement go, go away. Um, there are, there's arguments to be made in both those cases. So the whole, and I think part of the answer, if something like that is what's happening, part of the answer is that we do need, something Tony did bring up, uh, we need to be talking about taxing um, unearned income. How about entrepreneurship and innovation? Do you have any hope in that? We see poor people in parts of Africa, investments starting to come in, people using s mobile phones to start all kinds of solar tech, all kinds of new things. Does that give you any hope that some of the change could come from the bottom up? It, it, some of it, right? You can hope that that happens, but what if, in fact, and particularly what if, what if big data makes it possible for, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for robots to, to do a lot of, you know, we, we don't know where, where we're going with all of this stuff. For robots to write columns in the New York Times? Uh, there's <laughs> actually already substantial outsourcing of, of financial reporting to, to, uh, to India going on. Um, uh, and uh, no, and, and still there's a whole set of, of issues. Uh, I don't think you can count on any of that. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and we certainly, well, uh, that, was, that was one of our favorite uh, moments in, in, in last year's late unlamented campaign, which was uh, 
one candidate urging people to do whatever it takes to go out and borrow money from your parents to start a business, <laughs> right? Uh, not everybody can do that. Okay. Um, I'd like to mention first uh, the upward mobility that you said, uh, Professor Krugman, is not uh, as evident today, but I see it very evident in who gets scholarships for universities and for graduate schools, and these are mainly children of immigrants, uh, very underprivileged. Uh, there is tremendous upward no mobility in that sense today in the United States. Uh, but what I had wanted to mention is uh, the discussion of poverty, which in the United Nations is a major issue. You know, uh, there was the Millennium Development Goals that were adopted um, in 2000, and it has had a significant effect on poverty alleviation uh, in the developing world. The um, follow-up to the MDGs is now, thank you, the Sustainable Development Goals, and that this is universal. It is both developed and developing countries, and I want to know, thank you, uh, what your opinion is about or what you think should be part of the Sustainable Development Goals for poverty alleviation on a global scale. I'm just going to punt because I just haven't done my homework on those issues. Maybe Tony has? Well, um, I, the first thing I would just say is that, of course, those goals in themselves are quite remarkable. And if I'd been told 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that this would, we would actually agree that every country in the world was, sign, except possibly North Korea, I don't know, most countries agreed to sign up to the MDGs, that's actually a remarkable development in itself. Right. Uh, so I think that's the first thing we should say, actually, that's rather good <laughs> that's happened. We've gone some way towards achieving them. Of course, clearly, uh, the problem is that, it, although we may in aggregate have met a number of the goals, uh, individual countries have not done that. So I think my own view is quite simple, that in some sense we should continue uh, the current process with identifying those areas of the world where we've actually failed so far, particularly on the poverty alleviation goal, which is particularly in the case of the African countries. Which is so I think my answer is that we shouldn't necessarily redesign these goals. We need to persist in trying to achieve them on a global basis rather than an aggregate basis in total. And Paul, I do want to ask you to comment on this point, which I actually hear quite a bit, especially from those same rich guy types, um, that actually all this stuff about social mobility having ground to a halt is patently untrue because the very bright children of immigrants all Perfect. go to Stuyvesant and then they go to Harvard and then they go work on Wall Street. The, the very, very, very bright kids, right? The, uh, the, we're, we're talking, remember, Pell Grants, cut back, uh, scholarships, yes, I mean, if you are, if you can make it to the point of being in high school and being recognized as a very bright kid and Princeton is, and, and, and Princeton quality, then sure, <laughs> Princeton has, has the money and they will, but that is an incredibly tiny number of people and there are so many obstacles on the path to getting there. Uh, and then they know there's been some recent research uh, uh, about the with C.C. Rouse, I think, about how many how many bright students are simply unaware of these opportunities because they are essentially socially excluded from that network. So no, the the notion, you know, it, it's again, it, it's one of those things. You you look around, yeah, you look around the Princeton campus, and sure, we've got some some kids from amazingly deprived backgrounds who um, who are incredibly smart, and they're doing fine, but. Boy, that is, that is um, such a tiny piece of the American universe that, that, it, it, it's, uh, um, that it, 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 it just shows, in a way, how divorced our elite has become from the, experience, the lived experience of life for most Americans. Okay, please. Yeah, my, my question was very similar to that, but what is, you know, there's been a lot of coverage now, student debt is over a trillion dollars, what are the immediate and I'd also say longer term um, impacts going to be both on income inequality as well as this social mobility question? That is scary stuff and it's, it's, it's scary, I mean it's a, it, even short run, run macroeconomics, uh, you know, a trillion dollars is starting to be real money, so that's kind of scary. 
Um, and the impact, uh, and so much of it, uh, I mean, I don't know, I, I um, have this urge when I'm riding the subway here to rip those, uh, those ads for the various you know, technical schools to rip them down because you know that a large fraction of them are ripoff or um, operations that are going to le leave students with, with lots of, with crippling debt and, and no job prospects. No, this is, a, this is a, a terrible thing that's happening in America right now. That brings up something we haven't talked about very much, which is that inequality applies not just as were, uh, amongst rich and poor, it also is a question between generations. And I think one of the things which, particularly uh, for example, the austerity programs, uh, is very obvious, uh, cutting back of provision for young people, coupling with increasing fees and exp costs for young people, is having an unfair effect on different generations, whereas we, we tended to protect much more the benefits going to my generation. So I keep my bus pass, but they close down youth clubs. To the old are winning yeah. the generational wars. Or, or the older, sorry. Oh. Um, uh, please. Uh, sorry. Um, so in my social studies class in school, we've learned that the economic, uh, the way our economic system works is that there is a cycle. There's a recession, but then there's a peak. So, but then in 2008, um, I kept hearing, oh my God, oh my God, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die. So what I'm asking is, <laughs> Um, uh, Mr. Krugman has very much in his columns said the things that are wrong with our economy, which is great. I mean, it's making people aware. But since there's always been a cycle, uh, even if it takes hundreds of years for it to go up and down, is it possible that it we're kind of overreacting? Or are we going to even ourselves out eventually? <laughs> Uh, okay, I think that that's a question for Paul. So yeah. are we overreacting, <laughs> boom and bust, a natural part of the economic cycle? No. Uh, there, there are, um, this, this is, a, this is a, a one in three generations crisis. This is, this is, there has been nothing like this since the 1930s. Um, and there are various ways, you know, I can go on and on and on and on and on about it, but um, just think about the fact that normally, even during recessions, we don't have a lot of long-term unemployed in America. People find jobs fairly quickly. Uh, maybe they're not as good as the job they lost, but they find jobs fairly quickly. Now we have uh, um, well over four million people who've been out of work for more than six months, and increasing evidence that once you've been unemployed that long, you're never gonna get a job again. This is, this is completely different. The last time we saw anything like this was the 1930s, and we didn't really come out of the slump of the 1930s uh, until we launched a large public works stimulus program known as the Second World War. So um, this, uh, this, there is no end in sight to, to this thing we have right now, uh, or certainly not clearly in sight. No, this is a complacency at this point. Think, think about it. If you had said in early 2008, we're still gonna have extremely high unemployment, millions of people long-term unemployed. Um, um, Europe, actually back in recession in the middle of 2013, people would have thought you were crazily pessimistic, and that, that is where we are. Okay, I'm gonna turn a little bit to Twitter. First of all, Miles Korak, who is the guy who did the <laughs> research behind the Gatsby curve, is very glad that you mentioned his curve. Um, so there you go. Um, you're welcome, Miles. Yes, I should, I should have <laughs> mentioned Miles. I, I, I went to Alan because he popularized it. But he he wasn't Cole scolding. He was happy. Yes. Um, and uh, then a question from Twitter, um, which I'll address to you, Tony, which is, what about um, another potential danger that inequality poses to capitalism, which is that it makes it harder for potential innovators to get access to capital? Yes, well, I think it's... Uh, I mean, it's clearly an issue because I mean, I just, if you just look at the discussions that actually every country is having about the uh, problems of recovery, that a lot of it is, is directed at the problems of financing small scale business. And in a sense, that's where probably much of the innovation is going to come from. And uh, that, that's an area which, given our 
structure of, or I wouldn't say so much necessarily inequality as the structure of the financial system, which is a problem, and I'm not an expert, I should also say. Uh, but I think it's that rather more than necessarily than, than inequality it has any particular role in that. Okay, our time is very soon running out, so I'm going to take two last questions both together, and then we'll right. let you answer them, and we will have to wrap up then. So please, your question. Um, my question is about inequality and retired people. And I'd like to know if you're a retired person, middle class, and you have your money invested in treasury bond mutual funds, which are making 0% now, right. is it necessary to shoot yourself? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's a good question, sure, to help us conclude on a cheering note. Um, please, sir. Uh, are public goods best served by public institutions or private individuals? I'm thinking about, for example, Bill Gates, who has recently announced that within two years he wants to be able to eradicate polio around the world. Were he to pay higher tax rates and given those funds to the federal government, would that objective be achieved as efficiently as if he were to try and do it through his foundation? Okay, wow, those are two excellent questions, and I'm going to add a third. This is going to be an example of nepotism. Uh, Janet's father, Fred, who is 84 years old, sent in a question by email, um, and you touched on this earlier, Paul. Um, he's basically worried that New York also is becoming sort of a rentier metropolis um, where all the, the global plutocrats are congregating. Um, is that a downside for the people of New York? So those are three questions. You can choose to answer all of them, or you can't choose to answer none of them. You could choose to answer just your favorite one. Tony, please go first. Well, the answer to the first question is no. Don't shoot yourself. OK, <laughs> good. Yourself. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, th I think the, the, t the point you raised is a fair one. I had just said, of course, that the elders they were doing were not just hit so hard. It was, by the austerity programs, and I was referring then to the provision of services. But I think your, your point is clearly right that the, the zero interest rates is having an effect, uh, is, is hitting elderly people. Of course, again, it, it depends on, on uh, your system of social security. I think it underlines my long term belief that basically it's only through government providing pension schemes which you can actually provide an effective guarantee for pensions for people in old age. And that's what, of course, a, uh, that's what you, you don't exactly have at the moment. OK. Paul? Yeah. Um, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one. And, uh, do you want to do the philanthro capitalism? Yeah, let's talk about philanthropy, which is a wonderful thing. And it's uh, and much praise to, to those who engage in it. But two things to say. First of all, um, a lot of the public goods we need are beyond the scale of what even a Bill Gates can afford to do. Uh, just you know, there there are there are there's, you know in 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 a, in a 16 trillion dollar economy, um, then just looking at the United States, uh, we're going to require public goods on a scale that that even very very wealthy people are going to not be able to finance. And the other is that while there are some estimable, wonderful billionaires who do very good things with their money. Uh, Bill Gates, actually George Soros. Uh, there are also quite a few who are entirely despicable human beings, and uh, <laughs> um, and we don't get to you know we don't get to make that decision about who gets to be a billionaire, and and many of them are you know buying themselves yachts that are bigger than the Titanic and uh, or whatever else they may be doing, and and you just cannot count. Um, we we should we should praise and 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 laud the the wealthy people who do public good with their wealth, but we should also realize that many of them won't. Okay, and I'm going to ask a final, final blitz question of each of you. Um, so what is the one thing if you were sort of, Paul was talking about his uh, fondness for science fiction um, also before we started, and he's even blogged about it. Um, so let's imagine some science fiction world where each one of you is appointed sort of master of the universe. You can introduce one public policy change to influence this, uh, this whole suite of problems we've been talking about. What would be the one that you would implement, Tony? 
Only one. Hmm. Okay, you can do three. You can no, do no, three. I'll have two. I, I think one is I would certainly have like to see a proper global tax regime. Not necessarily intergalactic, but I mean, uh, <laughs> global. We'll leave that to Paul. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is I, you know, I, I basically think that uh, the idea of a basic income for children is something every country ought to have. Basic income for children? Yeah. Not for everybody? No, I think that uh, well, uh, children, is, you only, I was assuming I was limited to some degree, so I, that's where I'd start with children, yeah. yeah okay. You know, um, the, the late Robert Heilbrunner used to talk about good society, and he had this place that he, of his imagination that he called slightly imaginary Sweden, uh, which was, you know, sort of Scandinavia but done better uh, with, 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 with better weather and... Uh, uh, <laughs> Global warming could take and, care and, of that. And, and slight, yeah. slightly more uh, uh, bubbly people, I guess Danes <laughs> rather, rather than Swedes. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, they, I, look, I, a well-run welfare state, well-run modern welfare state is actually a, is a pretty decent kind of society. Um, and it, it can be done. And we have done it pretty well in various parts of the Western world. And I think it's more a question of getting back to those ideals than it is of, uh, about searching for some science fictional kind of solution. We, mo we basically do know how to do this. We just have chosen not to. Okay, well, thank you both. <laughs>